All right, welcome to today's episode of the Australian Law and the Garden podcast. We have Gavin Jones from Hunter Irrigation. I'll get you to introduce yourself in a minute, Gavin. Where yep. Your role is that um, I've been wanting to do this podcast for quite a while, actually probably a year, to be honest, where I wanted to sit down with somebody and explain in detail irrigation and and why there is 17,000 different types of nozzles that you can buy and what, you know, like I'm even just looking on the screen right now, we're going to get this up later, but there's, there's what, you got five different types of pop-up bodies and mm-hmm. a bunch of different um, gear dry sprinklers and a bunch of different stuff. And, and for the uninitiated, and I consider myself kind of in the middle, but for people who don't know, it is overwhelming to go to an irrigation store and just go, I don't know what to do. I don't know sure. which one I get. Uh, and then what they do is they go filter by price, buy that one, and move on. And often that's not the best idea. So we wanted to get you on to talk about that. Thank you for coming on. Can you introduce Welcome. yourself? What is your role? What do you do? And we'll get into the technical side. Sure. Um, Gavin Jones. I am the regional manager for the Pacific Rim, which pretty much covers Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, all of Southeast Asia. Uh, so we basically do the the support for the product that's manufactured in the US. So Hunter's been a company, uh, been around since about 1981 when it was first founded. Um, it's been distributed in Australia for almost 40 years now. It's around 80, 84, 85 when it, it started to come out to the Australian market. Um, start off with one product initially, which was just a, a gear drive rotor, but now clearly has expanded to a, a full range of irrigation products. Um, so, yeah, our, our role is is supporting the market with with Hunter products. So um, my background is more turf management. I did turf management for about 15 years on golf courses in Melbourne mm-hmm. um, and then, yeah, stepped into this side of the business. So it's been uh, interesting and it's been fun. One of the things you, you touched on earlier was a drought in 2009, 2010. Uh, mm. Were you working with Hunter when that happened back in well, the Victorian drought? I was, yeah. Yeah, so um, it was a big change. Um, even policy within the different states, it didn't matter just about Victoria. It was, it was uh, New South Wales, it was Queensland, it was Victoria in, project, in particular. Um, we had different, um, I guess, policies being put out by the government. Um we formed key supplier industry group as a part of the irrigation association, which I was part yeah. of. Um, and we tried to get a lobbyist in to actually talk to the different state governments to, to find out where they're going to go. Um, in particular, like Sydney, we had a, a program called Love Your Garden. And uh, it was basically you get a, a qualified irrigation contract or landscape contract to come in they do an audit on your system if you pass the audit yeah very basic terms but if you pass the audit you can then put your irrigation system in um and then when restrictions hit one of the those really loosely terms again but on the sunday night the government made a decision that no, there's no watering so you know it was yeah. bucket watering or was just hand out hose watering so um yeah. you know the drought the drought really made us look at as an industry, how how we're going to irrigate and how we can get across to the general public and also government that um, efficient systems are a, a better way to go than just putting your hose on and you know hand watering your garden. So um, it, ta- it, it we learned a lot through that period, and uh, you know I think we've made some advancements from there. Well, the thing I was that I think of because over here in WA, we don't get much rain and everybody basically has to irrigate, otherwise it's going to die in summer. Um, Mm. Off air, you were telling me that WA is about 40% of your business, if that's right, and we're what, like less than 10% of the population, so that makes sense. But I think over over east, where you guys get rain, the rain is kind of, I mean, you know, it'd be nice if you could schedule it to, uh, you know, I want X amount of millimetres every so often, you know, like you can your irrigation system. Mm. But I think what happens is a lot of the people who don't have a proper irrigation system or are thinking about it kind of have it in the back of their head and then they have a dry spell. 
And in that yeah. dry spell, they have to make all their decisions. And all of a sudden, they that's when they get daunted. And that's, you know, you need time to plan, you need time to think it through, and they don't have time anymore. And yeah. Yeah. end up making decisions that cost them more money because they're cutting corners or they're doing mm. something that they thought was right. It was just a simple mistake that mm. comes with lack of experience. Even with, with uh, like we talked about education before, when we were looking at, um, particularly in the Victorian market or Melbourne, Melbourne Metro, um, there was basically a, a ruling that went out, so to speak, that uh, you could only use drip in gardens. Um, yep. So the whole thing changed. So there was the, the dealers within the, the Melbourne region. It was all about tanks, pumps, and selling drip lines, and it was crazy times. So you know, from a perspective of working for Hunter Industries, you know, we we made a controller. That's about all you could use from our range back then because we weren't really doing anything with drip back then. Um, but there was also that that mentality that because everything had to happen in a hurry, and the people love their gardens, right? Mm. So they want to irrigate them. Um, so like, okay, okay, sell me the tank, sell me the drip system, and let's go. And then contractors run off their feet installing drip, ripping out pop ups. Yeah, and then it was about the education of well, how do you actually operate a drip system? And and people were coming back in the end and saying, well, why is my water bill so high? You know, I thought this was a water saving device, but the, just yeah. the education at the early days, early days, wasn't quite there on how to manage the systems that they were people installing. So um, that's the key thing. I mean, these sorts of podcasts and, and there's a lot of literature out there as well is really key to getting people to understand what um, what good irrigation systems are so we're already starting to get into some technical stuff we're going to go point by point and we we prepare yep. a little bit for this because there's so mm. much to cover but the whole drip versus pop-up conversation yeah. the whole how long should you run your sprinklers conversation mm. uh all that sort of stuff we're going to get into that, but we're going to go section by section. Yep. And so for those who are, who are listening, you go, what's this? What we're we going to cover? We, this is what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about different pipes. We're going to talk about pop-up bodies. We're going to talk about different pop-up nozzles, MP versus fan nozzle, all that sort of stuff. Then we're going to get into gear drives. We're going to get into garden bed irrigation valves, controllers, and everything else that comes along the way. But before we get into that, the number one question is, what are the basics of a good irrigation system? If somebody is walking into an irrigation shop and they are clueless, they're starting from scratch, what is the number one, number two, number three basics that you think people need to think about? Well, a good domestic system is basically going to deliver the, the a right amount of water to the plant as efficiently as possible without as much wastage, right? So you're trying to get that as a as a concept. Um, mm -hmm. Was you know what is the water? It's, it's key different things. So you know what is the water source? What irrigation type are you going to use? Is it going to be drip in the garden bed? If you've got a slightly larger area that you want to cover, maybe it's a low a lawn area that's bigger than eight by eight meters. Um, you're probably looking at a small rotor to a larger rotor. Um, anything under that, you could probably look at spray bodies and MP rotator or stream rotors, as we as we call them. So it's really depending on what you're actually trying to irrigate, but the basics are you're trying to get the right amount of water to the plant as needed. So you know, and it depends on how the how that gets the, um, implemented. So, well, a lot of people. Will they rock up to a shop and they have no idea, like you're just touching on there, do I get a gear drive, do I get an MP rotor, Is or do I, do I go down a different path and mm. start with? Mm. What – I guess people would be basing their decision on price a lot of times. So mm. before you even get to that conversation, though, a lot of time you've got to be measuring, like you just talked about the area you've got to yeah. be covering, but yeah. also how much water flow rate pressure – I don't mm -hmm. know much about this. I know enough being in WA that we use sprinklers enough. Mm. But is this something that you can do at home? Is this something that a new contractor can work out? Yeah, no, but almost clearly um, a contractor can come and do that work for you. But if, if you're going and you're thinking you're going to do a DIY type of system, you know, proper design and layout is key. So there are professional irrigation dealers right throughout Australia. 
Um, and that's what we try and promote is the fact that if you have some sort of concept around what you want to do with your garden, if it's a new irrigation system, it's a retrofit, just, you know, replacing some old heads, whatever, you know, proper design is key. Okay. So you want to get even coverage, don't have any runoff, don't have any dry spots. And these are the, the tools that, um, you know, an irrigation store is going to be able to provide for you, but you can do some homework prior to that. Um, you know, if you if you just have a, a sketch of your a yard, basically, but you go in there with some idea about how much water you've got available to you. So hydraulic capacity is a key thing, right? Um, we have conversation with different people. You know, people ring the office here and say, uh, "I got this," and, I, and we we ask the question about, "Well, how much pressure you got? How much flow you got?" Oh, I got heaps. Well, how much yeah. is heaps? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so you really got to be mindful about um, when you talk to people about what their hydraulic capacity is. They've actually have some data with it. So, you know, pressure and flow are pretty key to what you need to get a, uh, a good system. And, and these are the basics of what we're going to require. If you go into an irrigation store, if, they, if you don't want them to come out and do it for you, you know, these are the tips that you need. You can do it yourself. So. Um, so but understanding, if, yeah. So um, if you're clueless and you walk into the mm. shop and you just go, okay, this is what they're there for. Give me a design. Help me out here. Um, yeah. Some people get suspicious because they go, oh, well, mm-hmm. this is a salesman. And, you know, used car salesmen haven't done, you know, a very good job of, of promoting the idea of being a salesman, to be honest. And they go, is this person just going to sell me the most expensive thing because they're going to make more money and am I getting ripped off here? Um, does that happen? Do you get a lot of pushback from clients or customers with that? Um, look, not f- from our perspective, we're the manufacturer. So we don't, you know, we're not dealing day to day with with people in a shop environment because that's not what we do. We support the stores with what, what our roles are. Um, but no, I mean, the, if, if someone's coming in for advice and for help, they're there to help you with that particular project that you're trying to get done. So, you know, there's there's really key elements to what what they can sell you in terms of, yeah, if it's garden bed, maybe drip system is the best part because it's only narrow garden beds. If it's larger lawn areas and you've only got a couple of different options, you can either irrigate it with a rotating stream nozzle or you can no rot- or use a, a larger rotor. So, you know, this, it's – but there's – there's really only a couple of means as to be able to go about it, so they're not going <laughs> to rip you off as such because you right. need you need the thing watered, and this is the most efficient way to do it. You know, so. And I've always found with irrigation that the biggest rip off is always the cheapest product because mm. you will get the product down if for a short period of time, but at the end of the day, it's it's so you'll get the product cheaply, but it'll only be down for a short period of time. And at the end of the day, the, the cost to continually replacing it is actually a lot more than what people think. Mm. And I find that, yeah, myself, I, we've, we've used this example recently when we went on the tour around Australia, we had a, um, just over there, a little tap timer that was irrigating the uh, plants in here. And it was a real mm. cheap, nasty one. It was a couple of months old. I thought, oh, it'll be fine. You know, I only need it to work for two months. I've already got it, you know, and that's, you know, I'll just chuck it on. And at some point, it just stopped turning on. And then now when I turn on manually um, for a five-minute timer, it doesn't doesn't turn off. So, (laughs) and uh, I don't know what it cost. It wasn't much money, but the amount of plants that I lost, uh, which wasn't many, but, you know, at 10, 15, 20 bucks a a plant is uh, I should have just bought the more expensive thing. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of, um, you know, talking about, we might have been talking about tap timers later on, but, you know, a tap timer is a, a basic way of, of getting water controlled onto your landscape area. Um, yeah, there's varying models that you can choose, um, varying ways that they attach to the tap itself. I mean, the strength of the, the nut itself is pretty critical to to tap timers, you can't have too much pressure running through the things. So it's um, yeah, you've got to really do your homework as to as to what you're going to go. And this is where the the irrigation dealer comes in and assists you with that that information. So you know what what is your flow and what is your pressure? Um, how do we how do we you know get the most out of what you've got? 
Um, you know, and typically, if you're looking at a, at a smaller sort of area that you're trying to irrigate, you know, some of the pressures that you got at a, at a, at a static pressure um, might be, you know, 100 to 600 kPa, whatever that might be. But then when you're looking at the actual spray bodies, they get regulated at about 210 kPa, and that's the efficient um, pressure for the nozzle itself. So, mm -hmm. yeah, really, that's a that little bit of homework you can do uh, prior to going in and getting something designed up or, or doing it yourself. You, you really need to do some homework. So when you've got a um, – you just got running off a, say – normal residential house, what are you going to do to measure that? How can I go to the shop a little bit more prepared than just saying I've got heaps of pressure or I've got <laughs> not much pressure? How do you yeah. measure that with um, from a homeowner's perspective? Yeah, look, um, they're basically, you know, the pressure is what's propelling the water through the pipes, okay? It's generally measured in, in, K in our terms, it's generally measured in KPA. You can do a flow test, um, but you little you need some sort of flow testing device, or a, um, it's generally maybe a gate valve with a pressure gauge on it. Okay, and you can pick those yep. things up from the irrigation stores. Um, yep. A lot of the time, in terms of just getting your um, flow test done, you can do what's called the bucket test. Okay, yep. so you might you might take a nine liter bucket. Um, you need a, a timer or a stopwatch, um, and get ready for the. Under, under the tap just to see what, what's going on, okay? So remove any fittings from the tap, open the tap fully, you place the bucket underneath um, and just immediately bring start the timer, okay? So once the bucket's full, stop the timer and that gives you an indication of what your flow rate is in terms of how long it took to fill that 9-litre, if it was a 9-litre bucket, how long it took to fill that 9-litre bucket. Now, yes. if... It took 17 seconds to fill, okay, and you're mm -hmm. trying to fill it with nine litres. Um, you need to divide that 60 by the 17 seconds by the nine litres, rough terms. It might give you yep. like 32 litres per minute, okay? So then that's the sort of information you can take to the store and say, look, this is what I think I've got in terms of flow, yep. and then I can give you a bit of a starting point from there. All right, so I guess um, the simpler maths, because 17 seconds, you really you stumped yourself there with one of the hardest numbers to divide by 60. <laughs> but if you if you had it at, say, one bucket. Do basic of, math, yeah. <laughs> yeah, after 30 seconds at nine litres, you would have 18 litres a minute because you would get two buckets. Yeah. You know, if you had one bucket yeah. over one minute, it's nine litres. I found in Perth it's about 20, 20 ish to 25 litres is pretty standard in the areas that, that we're in. Um, yeah. I think that's kind of – my understanding is that there's a, <laughs> that's a legal requirement that has to be above 19 or 18 or something like that. And so mm -hmm. I think it sounds like they're, they're uh, engineering it to be as close to the lowest as possible and then, you know, going from there. Yeah. So a typical – like if you're just looking at a standard mains water, in, you know, taking off your, your – uh, outlet from the from the um, mains water, it's generally around forty to sixty liters per minute. Then you've got to allow for the losses and and what kind of system you're actually going to install. So, you know the flow the flow test is or the flow rate test is the bucket test is probably the easiest way to do that. So, yeah. All right, let's get into the actual stuff now. Mm -hmm. We'll do this very very quickly. This first one, but it is a question that's going to get asked a lot. The first thing is pipes. People will go to yeah. the shop. They've got you. You've got your PVC pipe. And I also want to just say this from the get-go, that there would be differences. My, my guess is, and my understanding from people I've talked to, is there is differences in the quality of brand. Um, mm. As far as I'm aware, you guys don't actually manufacture. So I'm just no, asking we're not, you. We don't do pipes, but no. I'm asking you in, a, in, a, in this scenario, in an unbiased fashion completely, mm. but you would have your PVC pipe and then you would have your pressure-rated blue holly line, which is more like a rural line that people use, and then your common household 19 or 25 millimetre, um, and sometimes 13 millimetre, I believe, but, but, but uh, your mm. common poly line that people just chuck some barbs and some clamps on, and that's super cheap. Um, is there a place for the poly pipe it gets a lot of hate sometimes because it's yeah, cheap and like nasty mm. what's your opinions on it 
but I think there is place for it. Um, depending on, it's really horses for courses. I mean, if you've got, you know, rocky sand, like sandy soil, but it's got a bit of rock through it, whatever, um, do you really want to be running PVC and doing all the fittings and whatnot? You're probably easier to run some poly as to the basically the ease of installation of that, okay? Yeah. Um, in probably sandier soils, maybe maybe in a WA situation, they, they might use more PVC. I know on the on the east coast here, we're probably seeing a little bit more poly being used now. Um, yep. It seems the ease of insulation when you when you use poly and you just use those press on fittings. Um, even when I travel to South Africa, they're doing the same thing: the full flow pressure fittings with the poly uh, mm -hmm. that they use over there. It's just simple, so. You know, you're not worrying about all the glue and all the bits and pieces that you need to do on priming the PVC. So, look, the pipe guys might go, "You, Gav, you're talking about rubbish," you know. <laughs> so, but it's really horses of courses, and and what you what the ease of installation is, particularly from a domestic point of view. If you're going to do it yourself, um, maybe you're better off using a, a blue line poly just to to make it easier to uh, to do it. And I've seen some videos of of recent times where you know guys are running out the blue line poly and it's just a very easy way to do it um your fittings are already custom made to to you know just plug in and and then you foot your arctic riser on whatever it is you know so it's it's um probably easier that way i would think but back in the day like when i was working on golf courses it was all pvc but that was bigger <laughs> that was you know bigger pipes bigger bigger diameter but um yeah horses of course well is there a pressure at which, say you have um, a very high pressure at your house, is there a pressure which you should go, mm, maybe the the poly isn't the best option or is it actually that uh, they can handle it just fine? Maybe it's the way it's been I installed think they, that's I th more important. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you can always put pressure regulation on. If the pressure is too high at the source, there's always pressure regulation you can put in there. You've got to put black backflow preventers on. So anything that goes before the you know the outlet into the into the line is always going to make a little bit of reduction in your pressure that you've got. So you know, pressure regulation is a key as well. So look, I think the I think the blue line poly in a domestic situation is probably probably fine. All right, awesome. So let me have a look at some of these pop up bodies. We talked about this before, but you, I'm just going to show mm -hmm. on the screen. You so have. Five different types of pop-up bodies here. I didn't even know this uh -huh. before I went on because I'm <laughs> this pro spray one, the standard black one that I've seen many, many times. Yep. I'm like, yeah, I know that one. Uh -huh. Then there's a pro spray with a brown top and there's a pro spray with a grey top and then there's two skinnier top. ones. And look, when uh -huh. I'm looking for a pop-up body, even me, and I'm in WA, we use a lot of irrigation, I'm just going to go for this because it just looks like the one that I've been using. But is that yeah. really what I should be going for? Uh, again, it's, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. So, all right, so some of the skinnier ones, say, yep. you got something like a PS Ultra. Now, that's going to have a fixed nozzle on it, okay? Okay. So it's going to be an adjustable arc nozzle, but it's going to be fixed in place. There's another one there, which is like an Eco Rotator, which is a similar thing, but it's got a, a MP Rotator already built onto the, the unit itself. Yep. So if you are a guy that's a landscaper and you know that you're going to use uh, an MP rotator that's a, you know, MP1000, okay, so you're only going to go, you know, two and a half metres to four and a half metres max on what you want your radius. You can yep. go in and just buy a, a box of those things. It's probably, you know, 50 in a box, whatever it might be, um, and away you go. You know, you just fit them on. You don't have to worry about fitting a nozzle, that sort of thing. So yeah. they're ready to go out of the box. Whereas if you go to the Pro Spray, um, and it, all the manufacturers do the same thing, they all have a very similar range. So, you know, a four inch yeah. body, so a you know, 100 mil body, um, yeah. and then you choose which nozzle you want to put on. Now, generally, with a, a Pro Spray or a you know, other manufacturers pop up, you're going to have something that's on the top already that's going to be like a flushing flushing nozzle yes. okay so when you yep. put the system in you can actually flush the system before you put the nozzle that you're trying to choose you can put that on afterwards so yeah you know, there's little tips and tricks around what you use but you know depending on what sort of pop-up height you need whether it's a four inch a six inch a 12 inch 
depending on how, what you're trying to irrigate, basically. So if it's tall plants, maybe you're going to go with a 12 inch or a six inch, depending on how high those plants are. So really, again, it's it's a matter of choice. But if it's just a lawn area, you know, a four inch pop ups, pretty standard. What I found- now the other ones, what you're saying, you you talked about um, yep. the grey cap and brown cap. There's pressure yeah, regulation yeah. built into those heads. So, a, uh, you know, the, right. Okay, so 210 kPa from a brown cap, that's optimum for a spray nozzle. Okay, so if you want fixed pressure regulation out of your spray body, you can use a Pro Spray PRS30, which is 30 psi. Okay, now if you were going to go with an MP rotator style or a rotating nozzle, you can go with the grey cap and that's regulated at 40 psi. So really, so, again, depending on what you've got. So my guess is that putting a regulator in the body itself would mean that every single spring club would be running the same pressure and that Correct. would mean that you would have as even a coverage as possible. Yeah, correct. Now, correct me on this. I heard this once and I didn't check in, but my understanding is that if you have a sprinkler line, say you have a single – we're running off a tap, just to keep it simple – and we have uh -huh. a single 19 mil poly pipe straight off the tap and say 10 sprinklers are running off that pipe. The pressure uh -huh. coming out of them without a regulator is, does it get less the further it goes or it gets more the further it goes? There's something, I can't remember exactly, but I remember someone telling me that, um, yes, even though they're on the same line, they don't actually quite have the same flow rate or the same pressure. Is that right? Am I wrong? Am I misquoting something there? Uh, look, it really, again, depends on how, how far the distance is that you, you're running. Okay. Um, and this is this is like early, early days when I, like I said, I had a turf management background. Um, so we're using bigger pipes, bigger sprinklers, the whole, you know, you're irrigating a golf course basically. Yeah. But when I first started with Hunter, there was a guy rang up and he said, I've got, 28 heads running off one zone and okay. I can't get them to pop up. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, again, people have to have that that um, knowledge and, and or gain that knowledge or do some, do some research about how much actual flow is required and how much pressure you get based on that flow for the sprinklers to pop up. I mean, 28 sprinklers, like you probably had a, I can't remember what it was. It was a long time ago. But, you know, you had far too much popping uh, up or trying to pop yes. up with the amount of flow that you had, you know. So, it's yeah, it, it's you've got to do your homework. So, I'm trying to find um, – I'm, I'm Googling whilst you're talking. Um, mm. I know that you've got a chart somewhere <laughs> with, with your different nozzles. I'm just trying to find yeah. it right now where people – it'll tell you – exactly how many litres will roughly, well, you know, depending on the pressure and everything as well, mm. right, but how, mm. how much water comes out of the sprinkler. And let's yeah. say, yeah. Oh, easy math, this could be completely wrong, but let's say you're watering one litre a minute is coming out of each sprinkler, right, and your mm. flow rate is, is 10 litres a minute, uh, you can fit probably 10 sprinklers and maybe you'd want to go a little bit less right but yeah. is that about right with the, the concept there even though the literage would be wrong yeah look it's it really depends um when you look at like i think we're going to get into rotors a little bit later but when you yeah. look at say it's a sports field rotor you're generally yeah. looking at around 60 liters per minute because of the nozzle size that you're, you're choosing and you got it in your probably throwing 20 odd meters with that particular nozzle okay yeah so at 60 liters per minute or a liter a second um you're going to have around that 20 to 25 to 30 mil application rate per hour now if mm -hmm. you're looking at a pgp on a similar thing because one of the questions i remember you, you kind of asked it's about a sports field um you know if you had PGPs on the same line as a, an I-25, that doesn't work because they have a totally different flow rate required yep. and they have a different precipitation rate that they're actually going to put on based on the nozzle selection that you've got. So, um, yeah, it's, it's you know, litres per second or litres per minute. You look at the charts, 
um, and then you can sort of base it on that. So back to um, we'll talk about the nozzles and everything more later, mm. people, because it's kind of like we got to cover. The problem is with this type of education is that everything relates to everything. You know, it's so hard to talk about the body without talking about the nozzles, and then once yeah. you start talking about nozzles, you start talking about different types of sprinklers, and then you're talking about yeah, all that sort of stuff. But mm. If we just get back, one more question I did have about yeah. sprinkler bodies yeah. is um, I'm not going to throw any brands on the bus because this is not what we're trying to um, do here. But you have said the on your website, the Pro Spray, meet the strongest, most versatile spray body in the industry. Now, the strongest is um, – I'm going to ask you about that in a second. But my mm-hmm. experience has been um, that the cheaper the body that they do actually – crack they do actually break they become brittle in the sun and we had this client and it was very frustrating they had a brand that was it was a cheaper brand and it was it's a package client that we were servicing so they were paying a lot of money their sprinklers the tops of their sprinklers were like most sprinklers exposed to the sun a little and we had this season where every second or every single visit we rocked up, another sprinkler had cracked on the top. And because mm. of that, the uh, – and we're talking about a big circle crack. Like I'm not talking about a fine little hairline fracture. The pressure oh. – the, 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 the sprinkler got more and more brittle and the pressure had gotten more and more to the point where we were essentially lost all pressure in that system because it was all coming out of this gaping hole mm. now on the top of the sprinkler body. And mm. it kept – it kept causing problems with our package because, you know, you, you fix it, you just replace the sprinkler. But it was like they all had um, the same or very similar amount of damage from the sun that they just all decided okay. to go roughly at the same time. Yeah. So what's causing that? And is is it a different type of plastic that's being used? Yeah, it's it would different be. thicknesses? Yeah. yeah, tell me about that. Definitely, yeah. No, it definitely would be. So the, the plastics that you use in the body – of the sprinkler and the cap itself, I know they got to be the most robust. And we do a lot of a lot of strength testing around what we do at the factory. So, you know, it's not just a matter of oh, we think it's round, you know, five hundred kPa where it might burst. We know that it's not. It's we, we pressure test it to a higher degree than that. Okay, so we yeah. do burst burst test pressures uh, burst um, tests that we do. Yeah. Um, so we know that once we manufacture that product because they're, they're you know they're pumping millions of these things out so um you know you got to make sure that whatever whatever product you're putting on the market is going to be stand up to and be durable so yeah we we uv test them we test them for burst pressure um so you know we're confident that you know when it goes out in the market it's going to be um, suitable to be in all the conditions that we need so now, we don't have to really worry about it in the US, uh, in Australia, but in the US, they obviously have uh, winterization as well. So, you know, they blow True. all the water out when it comes into those areas that have snow and freezing conditions. So, you know, you've got to be, you got to be, you know, a reliable product that can stand up to all the different conditions. So that's, you know, and all manufacturers would be similar. I mean, I don't know about the other brand you're talking about, but you know the, the main main manufacturers will be doing similar things. Yeah, it's it's the it's the same old age, just like the poor man bears twice. Because the mm. sprinklers, uh, they might be, you know, I don't know, they wouldn't be half the price, but you know they might be seventy percent or sixty percent of the price or whatever it is. Mm. I don't know, but you know you have to replace them in three years instead of 10 years or something like that. And yeah. the cost what are they, what, what's the old adage? You, you get what you pay for, right? So. Yeah, exactly. The yeah. other thing I've noticed before we move on to the other stuff is is there's – I'm zooming in on a picture here, people. When you have oh. – we'll I've clicked on the picture. Um, again, I'm having technical difficulties now, which is just part of the course of this podcast, I'll be honest. <laughs> but the, the, there's a white rubber seal right. as well, and this is yeah. another thing. Mm-hmm. When that starts to get brittle and you start getting a little leak of water coming up the, yes. um, the pop-up mm. shaft, oh, my goodness, that annoys me so much because it doesn't happen every time. And it's just mm. like, just get that right. And some brands, it's – I don't know what you're doing with the Roma, but it is there is a difference. Yeah, there is. So with ours, I mean, we can talk about that. Seeing as you're showing it, it's, we call it a co-mod wiper seal. 
co-molded hypersteel. So yeah. basically there's the, the rubber piece and then there's a, a piece of plastic that's inside there as well. So basically as the thing pops up and down, it's kind of gripping around the stem or the, the shaft of the of the pop-up. So, you know, that you've got to get that smooth up and down um, and you don't want any flow by it. That's the whole thing. You don't want it leaking out of there. So, you know, we use the most robust materials we can to make sure that you don't get those leaks uh, and you get wet patches around your, your pop-up. So there's, uh, there's technology around that too. Right. Let's get into... The nozzles now because i think that's what really people are coming here for they're gonna go mm-hmm. you've got the mp well hunter is kind of really well known for this mp rotator uh, i'm mm-hmm. not sure if you guys kind of invented it or it was very popular no uh, so it was all right so the, the history of mp rotator is that it was developed by a company called nelson irrigation out of walla walla washington uh, they're an agricultural company, agricultural mm-hmm. sprinkler company. Uh, they do other things other than that, but uh, predominantly that's that was their core business. Um, they developed the MP Rotator, and it was pretty much one of their only landscape products that they did. Uh, it was, came to Australia probably in around 2001, 2002. Um, mm-hmm. But being the only product that they did, they needed a better marketing arm and someone to develop it into the turf and landscape product that it has become. Now, yeah. Hunter acquired that product in 2007 and then we've gone on to develop a couple more models of the MP Rotator since then. But the development came from the agricultural point of view but got developed into a, a turf and landscape product. So. So for those people who are just listening and maybe they're brand mm-hmm. new, the MP Roto, I'm sure you would have seen these people, but what they are is basically it's a normal pop-up, uh, nothing different about the body. The nozzle has kind of fingers that rotate, fingers of water rotating around, not a flat fan, which is probably the most mm. common or, and historically definitely the most common type of pop-up sprinkler. What are you benefiting, Gavin, from having – those rotating sprinklers compared to just a flat fan because at the end of the day somebody will look at it and just go it's just watering the same area <laughs> yeah. what am i getting well you're getting much better wind resistance is one thing it's okay so when you think about a spray nozzle uh which might be just a if you call it a, a, a variable arc nozzle or a fixed arc nozzle which is just spraying flat water out um yep. it can be affected by by wind and drift okay so the rotating streams allow it to be a little bit more resistant in those conditions okay so there's plenty of videos out there about how the mp rotator works and you know what those differences are but it's basically mp rotator has the the principle behind it that it will apply roughly 10 millimeters per hour of application rate and that generally meets the infiltration rate of landscape soils, roughly. Right. So yes. it's applying the water in a fashion that will kind of keep up with the infiltration rate of the soil without overwatering, creating runoff, which you're seeing in the video there. Yes. Uh, so, you know, if you're applying it through a, a fixed nozzle, a, a, a general spray nozzle, um, yep. you know, they can be upwards of 40 millimetres per hour in their application rate. So yes. when you think about ro- MP rotator being around the 10 millimetres, 10 to 12, and then you're looking at a fixed arc nozzle, which is around 40 millimetres, clearly your run times are going to be different too. So you don't have to run a spray nozzle or an MP rotator, sorry, you don't have to run it uh, like a spray nozzle. So there's, there's a difference in terms of what uh, your duration of uh, time is as well. So to to kind of reword what you're saying, just in case someone's missing it, is that when you water with a normal spray nozzle, like a normal flat fan spray nozzle that everybody's seen before, the water output is so much that the, the soil often can't actually take that water at that rate. Correct. And, and you're either going to get, oh, if there's a slope, you're going to get some runoff, <clears throat> or maybe you might just get puddling and you wait for it to go in. 
the precipitation rate of the MP rotors is more like what the soil can handle anyway. Correct. Correct. So it's applying water slower, but your run times are going to be longer based on to get that same amount of water in. One thing that I've seen, uh, it was on the video, I'll put it back up again, but it was the section in the video where I was talking about, uh, for those who are watching, you're um, so listening, I'll try and describe it, but they've got, what I understand is that the further away from the sprinkler, the less water is actually hitting the ground, or it, maybe it's the other way around, I can't remember, but basically the water output is not actually even. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of... Uh, well, maybe you can describe it because what I'm seeing here. Yeah. Is so if you're certain if areas, you're, here you go. Yeah. If, so if you're spacing your your emitters out, so whether it's a pop up sprinkler, whether it's an MP rotator with a a body with an MP rotator on, or a spray, you're generally trying to get head to head coverage. Okay. Right. So again, when you do your designs, or when you go into a store and do designs, they will try and give you head to head coverage. So when the water is being thrown. Yes, you get a little bit of close-in watering, but the further out it goes, obviously there's going to be less water being applied close to the head. So you want that other head throwing back towards that first one, mm -hmm. and you're going to complete that that basically that that gap that, between them. So now head-to-head watering, you'll hear this this in through conversations if you go to an irrigation store or you go to a designer. Uh, you know, head-to-head -head coverage uh, will give you the most even application. But even then, we've got in this scenario here that the essentially the fan nozzle or the MP rotor is more even in how it, it sprays the water. Because I've seen this, the fingers that spin around are not all the same length. Some of them are no, shorter, some of them are they're, they're different trajectory, different, yeah, they are. They're different trajectory and different radius coming out from the, from the actual unit itself. So um, you get a bit of close in watering, you get some mid-range watering, you get some further out watering. So when you're throwing them head to head, you're covering all those bases, whereas a basically a fixed arc nozzle or a, a spray nozzle will basically just fan out, you know, it could be three metres, it could be four metres, whatever, whatever nozzle you're choosing to use. But it's basically... Mm -hmm. You get a little bit of close in head watering, but the mo majority of it is sort of going out onto that that distance that you're trying to get. So, whereas MP Rotator has the multi multi stream multi trajectory, and it gives you close in mid end and distance. So you still sell you sell all the varieties of, of we do nozzles. Mm. So there obviously is it's not it wouldn't be accurate even from your perspective to say that there is a one size fits all approach. No, what um, what would you recommend a person, you know, who's looking for the irrigation? I'm trying to find the flat fan nozzles now. Can't do it. That's okay. I'll get there in a second. I can't, I can't talk and yep. find at the same time. <laughs> what would you recommend uh, or, or what scenario would you recommend a flat fan nozzle? What scenario would you recommend the MP rotor? Well, I guess maybe the, we've been talking about the strengths of the MP rotors or mm. the weaknesses that the flat fan is, is better at. Yeah, look, I think um – Depending on what you what you're irrigating, you know, if, if it's a lawn area, small lawn area, maybe you can use a spray nozzle. You know, um, if it's anything that's kind of you know three to four meters, yes, you can use an MP rotator uh, one thousand because that's in that two and a half to four meter range. Yeah. But if you're putting it on with a, a spray nozzle, and again. It's it sort of goes country by country, state by state. I'm, like in my in my territory, South Africa is still a big spray nozzle market. Yeah. Um, New Zealand has gone all pretty much all MP rotator now, and the majority of what we're seeing in Australia is is more rotating stream market as well. Yeah. Um, so again, depending on on how you're what you're irrigating, whether it's just plants or whether it's lawn. Uh, there is an application still for, for spray nozzles, uh, but we're finding that uh, the way that's designed, so again, if you're if you're using a spray, and like I said, you're, you're going to use the, the flow rate and basically the application rate is a lot higher from a spray nozzle perspective, okay? So when you're looking at designing a system, you're going to need... A larger controller base because your station count is going to be a little bit higher because you can't put as many heads per zone 
with a spray nozzle than you can with an MP rotator. So we're finding that even from a oh. design perspective, people are using smaller controller count, so it's a station count with smaller controller, <coughs> um, less zones, therefore less pipe, less pipe, less wire, and yeah. a more efficient system based on the fact that you can put more heads per zone with an MP rotator because they are a, a lower pre rate. Right? Right, so because it's like back to what we were saying before with my, I said one litre a minute and versus, you know, 10 sprinklers on a 10 litre a minute system as my fake mm. example. Mm. But what you're really saying is because the MP rotors are taking less water per minute because the precipitation rate is lower, on the same pressure or the same flow rate, I should say, you can mm. have more sprinklers. So I guess what that would mean is because one of the biggest objections to the MP rotors from and a just an uneducated or a, mm-hmm. a um, semi-educated person is they go, I can't remember the price, but it's like 12 14 bucks or something like that. I guess it depends on the one you're buying as well for a single nozzle so, of M- MP rotator, mm-hmm. whereas you might be looking at 3 or $4. Am I getting those prices roughly right? Let me Google later. Yeah, it's probably in the look, shop, it, doesn't it? It, could be, it could be around that. Look, I'll, I won't quote pricing, but it is the fact that, yes, they are more expensive than a, a normal spray nozzle. But like I just said, if you look at the whole of system, Mm. You're spending a little bit more on the rotator itself, but when you design the system or have the system designed for you, you can have a smaller station count on your controller. You yep. have less pipe, you have less valves, you have less wire. Um, yep. So it all kind of can about, you know, balances itself out. So, and you, and get, can, you get a really efficient system. Yeah, exactly. So I can see, I can definitely see just running some numbers in my head. Like you go from a four station to a six station control, well, that's a couple of hundred bucks or maybe a hundred bucks yeah. more. If, you, if you're getting an a extra valve here and there, more pipe being dug, it, yeah, I can tef- definitely see the difference there. The hmm. problem I see sometimes what people do, talking about the price, is they don't know the difference and so they just go and grab a, you say the MP rotors uh, reach the end of its life and needs to be replaced. Um, they stop spinning every now and then, or they get they get mm. blocked, maybe. And you go, okay, I've got to get a new one. That happens. I go to the shop and go, Ugh, do I want to spend an extra eight bucks or whatever it is? And, yeah, no, I'll just get the fan nozzle. And they put a fan nozzle on an MP rotor system. Mm. Um, what's going to happen if we're doing that? Um. Uh- you you balance this out basically. So yeah, you put you're putting in something that's that's using four times the amount of water on one one head. Okay. So yeah. it's gonna throw your system it's gonna throw your system out, basically. So um if you've got rotators on one particular zone within your garden, stick with what stick with that. Don't don't chop and change and try and mix and match with sprays and rotators. It doesn't really work. They're designed to be working as a, as a system with with one particular head. Okay, so don't yeah don't mix a match. So just to we'll finish this little bit of the conversation here on the nozzles. What you're getting with an MP rotor is you're getting more wind uh, resistance. Is that the words you use, or it's, it's more it's less likely to be blown around because it's right, uh, yeah. individual mm-hmm. streams. Uh, slightly more even with the watering, but I guess you could counteract that with head-to-head design. Mm-hmm. You can fit more on a station, right? But I guess what you're saying is if you have a really small area, it probably doesn't matter so much. You could probably just chuck a fan, fan nozzle on uh, and yeah. I guess there'd be some other scenarios where, where you might yeah. want a fan nozzle. And we have we, – I mean, we've, we've gone with different MP rotators now too. So like I said, Nelson developed product early days. We've yep. gone on and done some extra work with the MP rotator. So there's a there's a short radius MP rotator now, which basically can go from 1.8 to three and a half meters, um, which is a MP 800. Then one yep. that goes from two and a half to 4.9 meters. Then one from 4.6 to 7.9. So you can get shorter radius with an MP rotator, but they have a heavier application rate too. So they're at a 20 mil application rate as opposed to 10 with the the standard in piece so you know it depends on what you're trying to do so those shorter radius ones they could work on a short lawn area as well or a narrow lawn area i should say well can you um can you just this is just a simple question for you can you please make a a a sprinkler pop up that waters perfectly evenly over a square yeah i know it's just an easy question right (laughs) like surely it's not that hard sure 
Yeah, no problem at all. I'll get the engineers on it. <laughs> that's the thing. Like you get these people. <laughs> it's like we're using these circles because everything has. To, yeah, I guess it has to be a circle if it's yeah, the way the sprinklers work. And you're trying to make them into some, you know, landscapes, strange triangular geometry, and all that sort of stuff. And you just go, man, it would be mm. nice if they, if you could just like just talk to the nozzle, like I don't know, some sort of Bluetooth connection. I need you to water it in this exact area perfectly, no overspray. I don't know. Mm. Do you think that could potentially happen one day? Look, like good design, design it? good design can really get to that. Like in terms of. Um, rotors in particular and and even the mp rotor i mean they're all adjustable to a particular radius yep. so if you dial those things in to not have the overspray i mean yeah you're going to get a little bit on the paths and whatnot but you know if you do set them up correctly they can be pretty tight on terms of where you need to get them um the radius and the angle right so yep. um you know it's 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 doable but uh just takes a little bit of work Next question, we got to get straight into this, right? You talked about how you started with, or Hunter started with, uh, gear drive. Well, I call them mm -hmm. gear drive. You call them rotors. Yeah. I don't know. There, is there a difference? Is it just the same? same gear thing? drives is fine. Yeah. Now, here's where I, I get confused. Well, we'll start with what you talked about before so we get the basics. Mm -hmm. The I-25, we have a system at a school, and I've told the story on the podcast before, although for those who listen to every episode, but... We had a system where there was a gardener who, who, bless his cotton socks, obviously didn't know what he was doing, and he was replacing I-25s, which are a very expensive sprinkler in the scheme of things, with PGP Ultras, which mm. are very similar size, same brand, right, same colour if you're getting a plastic riser because you can get plastic <laughs> or steel on the I-25, yep. um, and then putting them in the same spot. And it looked like it would work, uh, and the PGP Ultra is a much cheaper price point, so mm. why wouldn't you do it? And we were having a lot of problems with that system and ended up having to spend a lot of money replacing the sprinklers that should be been replaced. Yeah in the first place what's yeah. going on with that why is that the case that you can have two sprinklers that look almost identical and serve completely different purposes yeah so depending on what you're trying to achieve like like a pgp is basically a um 25 to 30 liter per minute rotor roughly mm -hmm. um applying around 10 mils precip rate a little bit high on the, on the larger nozzles, but they also are a three quarter inch inlet. Okay, so it's a smaller, smaller inlet size. Yeah. To what an I twenty five is now an I twenty five, particularly on a sports field, it's somewhere around that sixty liters per minute or a liter per second. So, and it's a one inch inlet. It's not a three quarter yeah. inch inlet. So it's a bigger inlet size. Um, and again, they're made for sports fields. PGPs, yes, you can use them on a sports field if you need to, but then the radiuses are a lot tighter. There's more heads per zone or more heads on the oval itself. Um, you yeah. know, I-25s are generally spaced somewhere around 15, 17, 18 metres apart, um, depending yeah. on what the design is. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's a, they're two different heads, basically. <laughs> So the where would you use a PGP Ultra? What what's the best scenario for that? Where does that suit? Lawns, like we have them, we have them all over. Depending again, depending on what what size the area is, mm -hmm. um, how much water capacity you've got, what the hydraulic capacity of the system is. But a PGP Ultra is the it's basically the the product that started our business as the, as, a, as a company. Um, so yeah, it's it's a a rotor that's um, basically used for large lawn areas, um, not generally used in sports fields. Um, have seen it on there, but not not in a general concept. But uh, yeah, it's it's a lot. It's a it's a lawn sprinkler basically. So, so sort of large 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 lawns up to very large, not very large lawns. I should say so. Mm -hmm. When you're talking a hectare of an oval or something like that, you want something that's a lot bigger. But I guess, you know, your small yeah. residential lawn probably doesn't need it so much. Mm -hmm. Well, anything that's over 
just say you had a lawn area that was eight meters by eight meters. You'd look at something like a PGP in that in that particular case, or you could do with a an MP rotator. But it's sort of getting onto the ed, the limits of the MP rotator in terms of that right. that kind of distances. But you know, if you've got uh, if you've got an area that's you know ten by ten, and you're trying to irrigate that, then you probably look at something like a, a PGP from that perspective, um, applying around ten mils per hour. Um, so you can work out your, you know, your run times per zone and um, it's using around 25 to 30 litres per minute. So it's pretty, pretty simple to work out. If you had a lawn that is in that sort of awkward range where you're like, oh, it's on the edge of what you do with the MP rotor, maybe mm. you're getting into now um, the bigger rotors. You've got these, these PGJs, SRMs, <laughs> um, <laughs> There's, yeah. for me, they are, they, they're very similar size to a normal pop-up, you know, maybe a little mm. bit taller, but um, they're these smaller gear drives. Why would I, or mm-hmm. in what snow would I want a PGJ or an SRM, which also, by That's, the way, they look like, almost exactly they, the same. It's an but, interesting question because when, before we had MP Rotator as a, sure. as a, um, a skew for us, Yep. Uh, that was our option for those areas that an MP rotator would irrigate. Now, still, people like a single stream rotor. Horses, of course, again, it's roughly 11 to 15 millimetres per hour, depending on whether you've got an SRM or a PGJ. They're very similar. Like you said, they're very similar in their specs. Um, SRM was the first of those half inch inlet rotors it shows pgj yeah. and srm are both half inch inlets so again they're smaller inlet size than the pgp um yeah but they're very similar with their nozzles now as well so the nozzle range the trajectory is pretty much the same these days um the srm has a a one-year warranty and the pgj has a two-year warranty um yeah, there are some slight differences between the two, but as a single stream rotor, uh, the application rate's pretty pretty low, and it's not that dissimilar to an MP rotator. So, you know, depending on what the person, if if you want, if you're into rotors, you can use uh, you can use PGJ or SRM, but rotator is probably the more efficient way to go about it. All right. Okay, that's interesting because that was one of the biggest questions that I had personally. Where I was like, they do overlap quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Now the radius is ten mil, ten meters maximum. So basically, four point three to ten point seven meters. Mm. Um, mm. What is the biggest throw of an MP rotor though? Uh, it goes out to about nine meters. That's, so the MP uh, three thousand. Yeah. It's. It's around the nine meter mark at, at its maximum. Now, one because of the you physically that- can't get you physically can't get enough water because you've I mean you've seen the nozzle they're this big right you yeah. physically can't get enough water through it to get that that distance is in very basic terms. Um, whereas a gear drive you you'd be able to push a little bit more through those to to get that. Here's the problem that I've had that's very unique that uh well i haven't seen it before maybe it happens all the time but maybe i'm just inexperienced but we have at this same school uh, we have a section that is on mp rotors mm-hmm. and very strangely it's the only section that is because again like i don't know what they were doing the rest of them are all gear drives but what i have found is that there's this kind of weird algae or something that grows in the pipes when it's not being used yeah. And with the MP rotors, there is a filter and it blocks the filter. And mm-hmm. then I've got to go out and just clean or replace every single one of the filters on this sure. system. Now, I don't know if that's because I need to put something in the pipe to clean it or do I, um, I don't know, what do I do? But one of the things that did cross my mind mm-hmm. is is replacing them with these SRMs or PGJs for the sake of, just a larger hole, and maybe mm. it would just blast the stuff out of the hole, um, not needing a um, filter. Um, now, do you know this algae stuff I'm talking about? Has that ever come up before? Oh, look, or is this yeah, just a we've, weird we've, thing with what we've got? No, no, no. We've we've come across all sorts of different uh, um, 
scenarios where that has happened. So um, any sorts of little crabs and little scale and all sorts of stuff. It wasn't just algae yep. growing in pipes, you know. So, um, yeah, there's there's obviously things you can do to treat the water prior to that, uh, which goes into a whole different <laughs> Whole different conversation, um, but yeah, look the the, the filters um, on rotators on spray nozzles are a certain mesh size, um, and they are to filter out any of those impurities that might be coming through the water. Uh, we know yeah. that not everything is perfect, and you, you can't get you know pure water source all the time. So you, these things pop up, but there is a little bit of maintenance around it. Of course, there is. Um, you know, if you're not seeing them quite operating correctly, yeah, you might have to pull them out. And we've seen examples even in, um, like we spoke about I-25s before, where you've got algae build up because they've got a filter basket on the base of the turret, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. when it goes up into the, the base of the unit. And you get said that all gets clogged up as well. So there's even maintenance with, with larger rotors as well. So... There is generally a filter basket on the base of the rotors, and that's if, if it's not getting caught on the MP rotor little filter, it's going to get caught on the depending on how much algae there is, it's going to get caught on the, the filter basket of the um, of the rotor as well. So they're still going to have to do maintenance of some description. So I'll be thinking that you probably want to treat the source, yeah, to try and stop the algae as the ultimate aim. Eh? I wonder. I was thinking like all those standard cleaning products I'd put. It to clean something like that would probably kill the lawn. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to fill my pipes with bleach. Yeah. And then, but there's and then, some, yeah, there's some nice products. We, yeah, I can't, I can't remember the name. But they're, they're, I ran into a guy one time who was treating it um, with non-chemicals. He had, a, diff, he had a, a way of treating water without the chemicals, and it was an inline filter kind of thing. But, um, yeah, I can't remember what he's called. That's a long time ago. Yeah, there's all this stuff that, yeah, again, you, you, people who become specialists in this field, we don't do a lot. And one of the reasons that we don't do too much irrigation is there are so many little mm. things like this. And the amount of, if you want to become an irrigation specialist, the amount of little things you got to know and the amount of parts you have to stock in your ute because yeah. it is so annoying when you're fixing a problem and you, you go, oh, I need a certain type of fitting for this one strange thing and you go to your ute and you realise you've run out and you've got to drive 20 minutes just to get one $3.50 part, drive 20 sure. minutes back again. And so I think a lot of people kind of avoid that. But then having said that, it is great money being in irrigation uh, for at least six months of the year because you're highly sought after, people really want it and um, you know, they'll um, bite your hand off sometimes Whatever price, give me whatever price because it's it's dying. I just want a solution, and that, yeah, it is the case. I mean, we we get a lot of um, information back from contractors and whatnot that say, you know, they are they are flat out. You know, peak of summer they are flat out. People people love their gardens and they want them to be beautiful and and they've got the opportunity to irrigate them because we're not on restrictions. Can't think of too many places on restrictions at the moment. So, um, you know, we're coming into a Another good season, hopefully this year, that um, you know everybody's going to be irrigating and um, have beautiful gardens and lawns. So you know it's, it is people are in demand when they've got that knowledge, particularly. You talked about before drip and line, and mm -hmm. that people needed some education on it. So what are we getting wrong with drip and line when we're installing it? We do. All right, I'll, I'll preface this by saying. We do have a range of drip uh, products in our in our range of product that we do. Um, we don't do a lot of it in Australia. Okay, there are companies here that are specialised in in drip systems, uh, and we'll refer to those guys as much as possible. But we do carry the range of of drip line. Um, one of the things that I discussed earlier was the fact that when the drought came. Um, people were so uh, adamant that they, you know, they, they want to irrigate their, their gardens, their lawns, whatever it was. The only option we had was drip. And I think the fact that people were going out and buying it, maybe installing it themselves, maybe having a contractor put it in, 
and not really being educated properly on how drip systems work and how much water they actually use and the maintenance of them that we got caught out. But this is, I mean, this is a long time ago. This is probably 2009, 2010. And a lot's changed since then. There's been a lot more education around on how drip systems work. Um, we saw drip systems going into sports fields and people were gearing up, like contractors were gearing up, running, you know, five lines of drip on the back of a machine being towed by a tractor. Um, those I don't know that those systems are still around, to be honest. Um, but in a garden perspective, yeah, that's you know, drip drip is a is a key component of those systems, and probably still is till today. Of course, it is, um, and it's basically getting water to the source in the most efficient way. So, like we spoke about earlier in the in the um, program, is that yeah, you, you're trying to get the right amount of water to the plant as needed. Okay. Yes. Now that can be drip line. It can be little drip emitters. So you know, just these point to point emitters that you can put on. Um, there's yeah. all sorts of different ways you can do it. One of the things that I struggle with 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 drip line myself is not knowing. I'm trying to find a good photo first. Again, I shouldn't. I shouldn't do anything on the laptop and talk at the same time. That's always <laughs> a recipe disaster. Um, you don't see what's going on under the surface. Mm. Mm. And I think because of that, people will have sometimes uh, issues with a plant because the plant's too far away from the dripper line or they'll have yeah. issues with um, how much water they're putting out because they've, they've got it set for 10 minutes or something like that. And they go, oh, 10 minutes mm. should be enough. But they don't actually mm. see how wet that's making the soil or what that really means. Um, mm. What is – there we go. There's a photo. That's what I was looking for. Um, what is the kind of spacing that we should be running these dripper lines like? Because what I've seen is, is, and I've made this mistake myself as well at my own house, is just chucking yeah. some dripper line, a single line through the garden going, oh, there's a hole next to my rose there. That She'll be right. And keep yeah. running it because it's a little bit more complicated from the basics mm. that I understand. Yeah. I mean, there's generally like a 30 centimetre spacing or a 45 centimetre spacing in terms of how they how they line up. Um, some of the some of the way you, you, you'd be more point source emitting. So if your, your plants are a little bit more sparse, um, mm -hmm. maybe you're better off with using just a, you know, a solid drip tube and then mm -hmm. having point source emitters going to each of the different plants. So then using a little bit of four mil line with a drip emitter on the end of it, and then you're basically dripping towards those those plants as required. So you know, instead of just running drip line, and yeah, that's the same thing, like running, you know, rings around trees and this sort of stuff. I mean, it, it, right. it's going to irrigate the tree, no problem at all. But, you know, depending on how that how that sit, is set up, uh, maybe point source emitting is a way, a better way of doing it if it's, if the plants are a bit more sparsely set out. When you're doing a dribble line, right, like so it's just drip, dripping out of an individual spot, an individual mm. hole in, in the pipe. Is it getting to the point where it's actually spreading out in the soil much or is it really just going straight down? Because I, I feel like this Well, it goes down, but it, it, you oh, you know, go, if you, you look go, at, sorry. Yeah, no, no. So if you look at some of the, the um, videos and whatnot, uh, basically it, it kind of forms almost like a, a droplet size, so it encases around uh mm -hmm. into the soil so you've got to, yeah if you look at some of the videos it's it's a little bit different to just you know completely wetting out the whole the whole space um so you're really depending on how you how you're running it out you know to, it's horses of course is again again yeah because i can i can kind of see like you say a sparsely planted um garden with a lot of large trees with large roots you know hmm. you could put some drippers in and it'd probably cover it just fine but uh, my experience at least is like small plants like let's say annuals like a lobelia or something like that or a petunia or something you've got to have it right next to the drip line hmm. uh, right next to where the the maybe the word emitter is what you're using but right next to where it's actually coming out otherwise you are going to struggle because it's not going to spread as, as mm. far as a, as a pop up would, I'm guessing. Yeah. Look, when we would um, again, I, I kind of refer back to the drought, and we were looking at what were the best options for, in and in particular in Melbourne, what were the best options for the big street trees? Now, a lot of the time now, you see 
a drip ring around a tree, something like that. When the drought was on and we were trying to preserve those big street trees of Melbourne, um, some irrigation consultants got together and they actually came up with an idea that instead of having a drip around it, they would use, uh, they basically cut trenches radially out from the trunk of the tree, uh, line those trenches with some gravel or some um, mix, and then yeah. they would have a bubbler nozzle inside the, the trench. So right. it would basically soak the trench, so it would soak, the, <laughs> soak down the roots. Uh, now, I don't know if those systems are still in, but uh, that was, you know, like I said, it was 10, 12 years ago now. But they looked at different options too. Now, do we use drip? Mm, not sure. Let's try this. And so they, you know, they come up with this bubbler in a trench idea. So, again, bubbler nozzles are another way of, of irrigating um, and just soaking around those trees. So, yeah, there's all, all micro irrigation is something we do have in our range, but there are other companies that, um, Probably do it, you know, more more of the business in Australia than what we do. Let's get into controllers, shop sure. because we're we're at an hour and eleven minutes, by the way, already, mm-hmm. and uh, this is something that you're well known for. So we've got to we've got to get our uh, act together and keep going on. I have a question. Whilst these are loading, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you've got these things called nodes. Here we go, node Bluetooth nodes. Um, mm-hmm. The picture hasn't loaded yet. But what they are is kind of like a portable controller. Is that right? Or could you explain it to me? Because I've, I've seen them at some jobs we've done, but I don't quite okay. understand them. I'm interested. A node is a battery-operated controller. So uh, the, the original node was called an SVC back in the day. Uh, we mm-hmm. upgraded it to a node maybe 10 years ago. Um, but they're a battery-operated controller, and they are connected to the valve via a DC latching coil, okay? So if you don't have power at a site, um, just say you're, it's a median strip or a roundabout or something like that, or you you know a piece of the garden where you haven't got wires running to, to that particular area, yeah. you can use a battery-operated controller. And Node is one of those options that you've got. Um, we've now upgraded that product to be Bluetooth enabled. So you've got an app on your phone, so you can talk to that controller and turn it on and off or set it to come on and off um, through your phone. And, um, yeah, look, it's, it's pretty pretty smart irrigation just from a little battery operator perspective. Yeah, it can be a single station, it can be a two station, it can be a four station. So, so talking about... My problem before with my tat time mm-hmm. here. Um, yeah. I only need one station in this warehouse, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll add a second at a future date. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm moving away from a normal tap time. But because these use the normal valves that are actually going to be reliable, um, mm-hmm. do you think that's the best option for me to use here in this kind we of do, Yeah, look, we, we do see nodes... Um, in that application. So they'll have the tap. There is a bracket that you can use to mount it near the tap. Um, awesome. And then you have it set at your valve. So yeah, you've got a, a you know, a standalone valve and you've got a, a, a node controller. Um, so yeah, that, that's an option as opposed to having a tap timer, um, which has basically a valve built into it. So yeah, it's, it's doable. Is there anything that I that you would recommend, anything else that you would recommend that I would choose? And I'm talking about this not just for myself, but a lot of people mm. might have a, for example, a, a courtyard or something like that, that they have, like you say, you can't get access to, you're not mm. going to be able to wire your controller to. They might just be using it as a, as a rental or something like that, so they don't want to spend too much money. In those scenarios, what would you recommend? Um, yeah, if it's only a small area and you've got a single zone, probably a node BT or something of that, that similar scenario would be good. Um, you know, later down the track this year, there'll be a product that we do, which is called a wireless valve. So that will take a module in a, in a um, AC controller and then 
wirelessly talk out through low rate lower radio to to the valve but in oh, a wow. out situation yeah but that's i mean it's, it's sort of end of the year novemberish um that'll be released but um yeah look from that perspective in the current situation now no to be the the way to go okay so this wireless is this going to be the future of the industry this wireless valve or is yeah, this we're pretty like- excited. yeah we're pretty excited about it yeah so, right, because that, that um, sounds awesome to me. So so essentially what you've had to do, I'm going to explain this as if we're complete novices here that are listening, okay? But you have to dig these wires and, uh, you know, have them running to each valve from the controller to tilt when it goes on and off. Easy, mm-hmm. simple, everyone understands that. The The most frustrating thing that I found with, with irrigation when you're maintaining it is when there is a problem that is electrical. Because it is so hard. You might have a nick in a wire at some random yeah. point because somebody was digging a hole too close to the pipe and they have no idea that when they planted that plant, they nicked the wire. But now the irrigation doesn't work. And you're like, well, how do you find that? And there's, uh-huh. it's just it's, it's a level of maintenance issue and frustration that is really painful for people. And it's an extra cost because you've got to yeah. dig and dig and dig and dig. So what you're saying is essentially you can have a controller – and send a wireless signal to a valve and eliminate the need for the wire, eliminate the need for the trenches. Is that that's, that's, the, that's, going, the, right? that's the future, yeah. That's the future of it. So when you think of those scenarios, this will be a solution for that that kind of scenario that you, you've just discussed. So, yeah. Okay. Now, um, now I'm going to have multiple stations at the warehouse. I've told you I only needed one, but... <laughs> One of the things that was stopping me from doing that is I didn't want to go through the effort of having to set up all these different uh, – I've got to put wires in places. No, I don't mm. want to put wires. Mm. So now it's not – okay. What other limitations? Is there a distance limitation with these wireless valves? Yeah, look, we're, we're looking at um, – kind of around a 650, 700 metre range from the controller. Now – Really depends on are there buildings in the way? Are there trees going to block that? Because it's a radio signal that's going to be used. Okay. Okay. You can you can have a rep- if it's over a large distance, you can have a repeater mounted somewhere which will pick up that signal and send it on to the next valve. Um, yeah, it's it's around that six seven hundred meters as a as a general rule where you're going to be talking from the controller to that to that remote valve. Well, 99% of applications would be less than that. That's a massive yes. site that's to be mm. 600 metres long. Maybe that's a retirement yeah, it, village. It's a, it, can be a, yeah. it can be a commercial product and be a, 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 a agricultural product, that kind of thing. So it'll fit a few different, a few different ranges. Awesome. Now, is there um, – well, okay, we're getting into the valves now and we're talking about mm. valves. But there's yeah. different valves, different pressures. I'm assuming there's mm-hmm. going to be different – uh, with the wireless ones, I'll put the valves up on the screen while I'm talking. But the, um, is there is it going to be the same? Where there's going to be wireless for multiple different valves across different pressure ratings, uh, or is it going to be starting with just one? Yeah, no. Look, we um, we create basically one solenoid, a, a DC solenoid, and we do an AC solenoid for our valve range. So. Um, yeah, depending on what the application is, whether you're using just a one-inch valve or a two-inch valve and you can go up to a three-inch valve with our gear, um, you know, the solenoids are matched all the way through. So, um, But, yeah, really depending on what that system is to, to which uh, which valve you're, you're talking to. Nice. Um, and what are we going to expect or what should we expect price-wise on these? Yet to be determined. Well, <laughs> the the uh, the marketing material will probably be out by early November, and then we'll yep. have a better guide as to what that will be. I guess it's tough, like, to release a new product because when you're, I, I understand a little bit of this, uh, but the accountants, this is the nightmare that would have is that a lot of the, the you know supply and demand is is what drives the price, and when you, before you've re- the products you can only estimate what the demand is and you know if you go a little bit too expensive no one buys you know we get mm. less purchase a little bit too cheap maybe everyone buys and you realize that you didn't you know you're not making any money off it so 
Mm. Yeah, I feel, I feel sorry for those guys having to release that tough, tough job. <laughs> um, uh, that's their job, though. They're they're in sales and marketing, so they uh, they need to get a an understanding yeah. of what the uh, the market can can take. <laughs> what makes a just try and be keep this brief. I want to keep this to an hour sure. and a half. Um, yeah. What is the difference between going back to controllers? What's mm-hmm. the difference between a really good controller and some rubbish, really cheap thing? Uh, is it easy to spot in the shop? Is it just price point? What should we be looking for? Good question because a lot of what we see now is uh, Wi-Fi-based control. Okay, so it's it's yep. – it's smart watering, smart irrigation these days, which is people are, are chasing. Um, they want some sort of phone connectivity um, where they can turn the controller on and off. Um, they want to be able to remotely access the controller. Um, they want to be able to use smarter technology in terms of weather data to actually base your mm-hmm. scheduling on, not just time-based watering. So you're scrolling through the, the range there. Um, there are some of the controllers further up the list that were uh, basically just time-based controllers, but you might put a sensor with it to, to give you some sort of weather data, um, yeah. whether it's just a basic um, rain sensor to, to shut down the controller when, the, when it's raining. You know, it's, it's simple stuff. Um, but we are seeing a lot more controllers now that are Wi-Fi based, that are smart controllers. Um, when we say smart controllers, using weather information to be able to to, to to do your scheduling. Yeah. So do you feel that these older, simpler things, are, you know, they're a dying breed or do they still have a place? No, I don't breed? think so. No, because even, <laughs> even some of the ones that we do, um, like the X2, the control that's sitting on the on the screen there, it yep. can be upgraded to be a, a smart controller by putting a, a and a Wi-Fi dongle in it, um, as for want of a better term. Um, but there are still some of the controllers in the range that yeah, just they uh, time-based watering, but um, you put a so we've got a product called a Solar Sync, which is, takes in um, solar radiation. Uh, to basically do your adjustment based on that. So temperature and solar, it's, it's, it's some smart sensing that go onto a time-based controller. So, you know, again, it's horses for courses with how you want to, how you want to control your, your system. Um, yep. But yeah, the, the, the basic controllers are still there and still available. What I've found, you know, it's very interesting having this conversation from the, the efficiency or the wastage standpoint because my belief is that people will drive past a house with a very nice green lawn, you know, in Western Australia specifically, and they'll say, this person must be watering a lot. But what I actually find is that a lot of them, not all of them, some of them do, some of them are just watering, and, you know, we've got restrictions. Some of them are breaking those restrictions. But what I actually find is that a lot of those people, they're just being really intelligent with, how they do it yeah. uh, and yeah. when you're talking about these sensors and all that sort of stuff that to me is uh, that those people will use who use that sort of product will use way less water and get way better results than the people mm. who are uh, sort of just chucking their sprinklers on and then someone drives over a sprinkler and they've got, you know, a nice water feature in the front yard and they water it at 4 o'clock in the morning so I've never noticed and it's just rushing down into the stormwater drain and it's all being Mm. wasted and at the end of the day they then look at their neighbour who's got a beautiful green lawn and they go, they must be watering way more than I am. But what you actually might find is that they're watering less and none of it's being wasted because they're being intelligent about it, right? Yeah. Western Australia is a great example um, the Water Corporation has a um, a program in place which which encourages smart irrigation. Okay. Yeah. Um, now you use a WaterWise contractor to come out and does an audit of your system. You can go and purchase a controller from a WaterWise um, registered dealer in Perth, uh, and even in the Peel region, I believe. 
um, that will then give you smart control, basically. So they're encouraging you to have yeah. an efficient system, um, which is fantastic. I mean, I wish we had more of it on the East Coast. I think we're starting to implement a bit of that. But Western Australia, like we said very at the very start, is it's, it's generally around 40% of the business that we do, but there's a reason for it because reticulation, as you say, is a big part of what you do in, in the Perth region. And, uh, yep. you know, if you can get smarter control and be more efficient with it and it's encouraged by your water corporation, everything, everyone wins. Yeah. And there's a, uh, yeah, it, I guess it's more pertinent here because we don't get the rain and so there is more mm. incentive to do it. No, I agree. That's one of the smartest things that they do. The the water restrictions, what what I, what I wish they did is I wish they had the water restrictions be a little bit more seasonal, like exactly what you're mm. talking about because what they say is, oh, you're allowed two, two watering days per week um, from yeah. September through till May, I believe. But yeah. the reality is... You have your sprinkler ban, yeah. Yeah, you, in winter when you don't need it at all. But yeah, in winter, go, yeah. yeah. The reality is, is most of the time you actually don't need two watering days in September. You know, mm. you, could, you could take those two watering days and chuck them... The extra, yeah, you know, uh, cap them then and then use them in December or use them in January. You really, we almost never actually need to water the lawn after April if it's really healthy mm. going into it. So you could take all those days and put them in January and February and where you actually really need it, which is late, late November through to kind of mid February or even late February. Mm. It's like, yes, yeah, sweet, we can get some, you know, extra water in then. Um, and I wish I wish there was a little more flexibility with that. But other than that, they actually are pretty intelligent, and it's based yeah. on how many millimeters you're using, not run times. It's, it's they're trying to encourage uh, those uh, the MP rotors because they have less wind drift, and you're using yeah, yeah it's using the it's stuff. using the right technology to get the most efficient. Like we said right back at the start, using the you know getting the right amount of water to the plant lawn whatever you're, you're irrigating. Um, yeah. As efficiently as possible, and you know there is technology now that allows you to do that a lot smarter than just that. Back in the day, the time-based watering, some of those little slide dial controls that you used to have, you know, five minutes here, ten minutes there, whatever it was. Um, the efficiencies and the manufacturers putting the effort in to make them smarter um, has been a, a big advantage now. So, and we're seeing that that. Um, water corporations and and um, hopefully governments are, are taking note of that. And you know, if it comes round to drought again, particularly on the east coast, we've we've been through it a couple of times. I know you've. It seems like Western Australia have had it sorted for a little while, better than what we've had. But um, as long as they're listening, you know, that's that's the whole thing. We're trying to tell them that if you have an efficient system and it's designed well and you're using the right products that you know it beats hands down just standing there with a hose just watering your plants that's just the most inefficient way you could do it well mate thank you so much for coming on uh Welcome. where can where can people find a hunter and uh more information about the products you do yeah so we are sold through most nearly all professional irrigation stores in australia you will not find us in the big box stores. You would only find us in professional dealers. Um, information is, you, I mean, you showed the website, so thank you for that. Um, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of video content uh, on that website. We have um, something called Hunter University, which is on the website, which is free training materials that you can use. Um, there's literature like the residential design guide here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you ring the office number, you know, we can send those out. It's a lot of information that you've got at your hands. Um, the Residential Sprinkler System Design Guide is is a key, um, helps you through all that process about how to design and what or what you might need to take to the dealer to help help you with the design of the, process, uh, the project. A um, lot of literature around these days and a lot of video content. So it's all there. Sounds great, mate. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, hey, you're welcome. Hit up that Hit up that website and uh, everybody else, I will see you in the next podcast. Thanks, Luke.